Good evening, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> it's a uh, welcome to this uh, in the vineyard with session. Um, it's uh, going to be uh, very exciting. I'm sure it's all about uh, natural rosé, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, co-host this evening with uh, uh, one of the world's top experts on rosé wine, uh, Elizabeth Gabay, MW. And um, we will um, talk to four uh, um, wine growers from different parts of Europe. Um, we will, uh, uh, if I'm trying to uh, share with you what I see here, is uh, um, just to orientate you or to, uh, about what's, uh, where we are. Here we go. Can you all see that? So we have from east to west, we've got uh, uh, Slobodne from Slovakia. A fascinating story, I'm sure they'll uh, touch on it. Um, history of uh, um, tobacco growing, etc., etc. Um, farm that was taken away from them and then taken back recently and uh, getting themselves into uh, producing all sorts, not just grapes and exciting wines. And just across the border from them is Johannes uh, Zillinger from uh, Zillinger Wines and um, also uh, a, somebody that is a pioneer in his region. Uh, you have uh, a region that uh, predominantly uh, grew uh, white wines and he's making rosé and uh, reds as well. And uh, moving on to uh, the Moselle here is uh, Jan Blicke that uh, is uh, getting uh, into uh, Pinot Noir as well as the Riesling and a few other exciting grape varieties. Um, and finally, uh, quite far away from them, but in a very famous region is uh, Dominio de Aguila. It's uh, uh, Jorge Monzon and Isabel Rodero. And just uh, to, um, well, it's um, Jorge comes with a very, uh, shall we say, conventional um, uh, education in uh, studying his analogy in Bordeaux and working in illustrious uh, wineries as Romane Conti, Vega Sicilia, and Arzuaga Navarro before finding just over 10 years ago uh, some old vines in Ribera del Duero and starting making some exciting, very exciting wines. And uh, so we will cover uh, issues that I'm sure will interest you as far as any rosé is concerned, but especially natural rosé. We'll talk about the history of rosé. Uh, we'll um, talk about color and color variation. And uh, we will uh, um, get to talk about vinification, vineyards, uh, treatment, and uh, the deep conversation about uh, substance, if rosé has substance, if it can be classed as a cru, uh, and if it can age, and, um, and many more things. <laughs> so first I want to start with a, a question to uh, Liz. Um, it's, um, uh, how do you see, what is actually rosé? What constitutes rosé? Because uh, you have, this uh, trend that hit us about 10 years ago of pale, pale rosé from Provence. And uh, now we get some that are deep and uh, uh, you can, some people say, is that not a red wine? So how do you see what, what I know it's a big question. What, what makes rosé wine? Um, yeah, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Moshe. Hello to everyone. Um, I think for me, uh, you know, especially since I live in southeastern France near Provence, uh, we get this constant imagery that rosé is pale pink and dry and classic character, doesn't age well. And uh, when I study rosé, I realised that we would get um, rosés that were possibly very dark and some that were very very pale almost white and so then I'm saying well what is the definition of rosé can it really be the color because if it is the color 
we could include white wines with a touch of red wine as we can get in uh, America or Australia or New Zealand. Um, white wine is, we know white wine is not fermented on the skins unless it is skin contact wine or orange wine. Red wine is fermented on the skins. And then you have one of the oldest appellations of rosé, rosé de Risi, which is almost completely fermented on the skins, but then taken off the skins. And so my theory is that um, this idea of defining wine by red, white and pink is actually a 19th century construct that uh, we like to categorize our wines in lots of different ways. And in actual fact, rosé can be anything from white to almost red, but doesn't finish fermentation on the skin. It's not a red wine. Um, it can include white grapes. And this is, um, if you can see, this is from Johannes Zillinger, who will be talking later today. This is his rosé. Um, the light is obviously reflecting a bit against it, so it's looking a bit darker um, than it is in my glass, but it's still almost a red wine. So I think that my idea is that throw out of the, um, the window this preconception of what is rosé. And in fact, on Twitter today, somebody was going, I've got my Pinot Grigio Romato. It's pink. It looks like a rosé. So I said, then if you define it by colour, it is a rosé. So forget the definitions. So that's really where I'm coming from. It can be almost uh, any colour very, very loose definition on vinification. Um, so maybe we will hear a bit more from everyone today as to how they would define their rosé. So it's not, uh, Liz, it's, it's, it's not a matter of tannins, obviously, because you can find uh, the, 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 it's, so you say it's really how the winemaker decide to uh, name it, really, because... Uh, more or less, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you also have false varieties, you know, like Pulsar and the Jura, which is so pale it looks like a rosé, but is fermented as a red wine. So yeah, it's it's very much what is put on the label. And a lot of Pinot Grigio skin contact wines are called rosé because they're fairly pink. So um, that's sort of quite an interesting point of view. But I think what is interesting, if we can go straight on to um, the history of rosé, um, originally rosé was very much a field blend of red and white varieties depending on the vintage. And if we can go on to, if everyone's moved around, I can't see him. If we go on to Ribera del Duero, to Jorge, to talk about um, the history of um, your clarete, and the wine style that you have there? The clarete is uh, our wine. Uh, the red wine is the, the story is very centuries before. Don't, uh, the red wine is the only uh, 30 years ago. Uh, before it's only Begasifilia make the red wines, but uh, the, the historic uh, wine is, uh, is clarete. 200 years ago is only clarete and for me it's uh, all wine clarete is the yeah. can you explain to everyone what a clarete is the clarete is the mixed the field blend of the ancient vineyard otherwise is the 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 old vineyard is the new vineyard for us is the mix it between different uh, varieties local, local, local varieties. Is the, um, uh, normally is uh, in the Ribera del Duero, is, uh, is very high, is uh, near to 900 meters, and the ripping is not perfect, different vintage. But uh, normally is the fresh September, mm -hmm. and the, the slow ripping. But for example, is the vintage not the good ripping for the boval, mm -hmm. but the other, but the 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 slow ripping is very good for Grenache, for example. But the Tempranillo is the only variety. Its vintage is fantastic. Donc, uh, the um, the um, 
the essential mix the the clarete is the the red variety is uh, called tempranillo mm -hmm. is the local variety after uh, the white variety because it's the mix in between uh, white variety and red variety is the albillo mayor mm -hmm. yeah, is the historic uh, variety in the area but is the difficult uh, viticulture is uh, difficult uh, the harvest uh, for is the reductive uh, variety don't uh, so is uh, um, the people not love growing this variety but and this variety normally is the 30 percent more or less and after is uh, latin people in spain don't uh, mix it a lot of varieties a lot of things uh, Monastrel, eh, Bobar, Garnacha Blanca, Pirules, eh, Cariñena y muchas otras. Hay a lot of the other variety I don't understand. Don't. Clarete for us is the mixed, the field blend in the vineyard. The normal is the old vineyard because the new vineyard is only red, only new clone tempranillo and the small quantity of Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot. Okay. So, uh, so Clarete is our story. Okay. When, uh, I am I'm born, I think my father and my mother is, uh, is roasted to the Clarete, you know? <laughs> it's, it's my, my blood, you know? So do you find that because of the altitude um, and the, having a white variety that gives freshness and acidity to the wine? It's, it's true is the altitude and is very important the the limestone the chalk is very important the pH uh, what is the the measure of the of the acidity of the soil is very high medium is eight is very very high no um, the quantity of uh, fresher Mm -hmm. Two is the quantity of influence of the limestone for me. The small quantity of the citron, of the, um, the marañón, the Latin American fruit, is, uh, is very important. Uh, the, the, shock, the, the, the limestone, the chalk. Okay. It's the mix it, you know? It's the mix it between high altitude. This is the reason Ribera del Duero is possible the wines more possibility of aging in the time okay even the clarity yes yes why a uh, question i'm sure people will want to know uh, jorge is uh, uh, why uh, clarete in uh, ribera del duero is m not more common <laughs> i know because Albino, because, Al because it's more easy make the red wine with the chips <laughs> With the the chips in English, the chips, the, chip, yes, the chips, the, ah, chip, chip. Yeah, the chemical products. You know, <laughs> the clarete is in wine with uh, the old vineyard, or very small yield, and uh, the fermentation is very slow, and uh, for making uh, the meridional countries in Rivera is very easy make the good red wines it's very easy why do you make uh, the clarete uh, the difficult clarete is if it's possible make the ac red it's not uh, <laughs> the, the only people make the clarete is the crazy people a little <laughs> bit you know <laughs> And uh, sorry, just uh, before you go about this subject, Cathy uh, uh, is uh, uh, asking about uh, what is the contribution of the limestone to to the clarete, because obviously Ribera del Duero have different terroirs. What do you think that brings to the clarete? Um, the, um, Ribera del Duero is uh, normally is only the the soil basic, the limestone. In the small party of the Ribera del Duero. Is a um, more tertiary soil, mm -hmm. but uh, is uh, Ribera del Duero is limestone. 
Okay. The, um, la, the, in the big difference between Ribera del Duero and in other places in Spain is the limestone. For example, uh, uh, Rioja. Rioja is the beautiful wines, but it's not uh, the, 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 the um, fresher in the mousse, a lot of, and the um, sabor, the sabor mm -hmm. is more slow because it's not a lot of limestone, the good limestone. For me, the limestone is not the, the chalk, uh, the, 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 you know, the, this. Not this, it's uh, a lot of things. It's more important the mixed, you know, the limestone. Claro. And the clarete is the. Uh, sobre todo, como se dice? Sobre todo, como se dice en inglés? Overall. Surtout, en français, parce que j'ai vu qu'il a du monde qu'il parle en français. Ouais. Surtout, <laughs> the limestone, ce qu'il donne, c'est la structure, c'est ça qu'il donne, la fin de bouche, la longueur. Et puis la complexité, c'est comme le rouge. Les, pour moi, les grands vins rouges du monde, ça se fait dans des sols calcaires. Et ça, ça se donne les longueurs en bouche. Pour les clarités, moi, je n'imagine pas faire un clarité avec des sols argileux. Okay. Moi, je n'imagine pas. Et puis des sols granitiques non plus, basaltiques. Parce que ça serait un peu trop étroite et trop... Okay, so let's, from that, let's go on to Jan, um, who is from an extreme going to a cool climate making rosé. Um, has rosé, has, does it have a long history? Red wine have a long history? Can you tell us a bit about your area? Yeah, Mosul had a big history um, in, yeah, till 1890 actually. Um, so the Rome people came here to um, the south of Germany um, and make it to, to Trier, which is the oldest city here um, in Germany. And they planted everything in, um, like, they planted white varieties as well as red ones. And yeah, one year the red went, went better and the other years the white went better. And um, yeah, but around 1890, the reason got quite popular. So actually, um, Trab and Trabach, which is just the next village, got the second biggest um, wine trading city in the world, like next to Bordeaux. And Riesling got actually better prices than the best Bordeaux today. And uh, from that on, everyone's like, oh, Riesling is quite good. So everyone is planting Riesling because Riesling is actually quite thankful. Um, it's, yeah, as you know, people call Riesling the king of white grape varieties uh, in terms of you can make any type of wine quite good. It represents mm -hmm. the terroir very, very well. And you can make a sweet wine, a dry wine, and uh, even orange is possible. So it's a quite cool, nice um, grape variety to play with. So this is why the red wines uh, went away till the 80s. And in the 80s, the Pinot Noir popped in again. Um, we still have mostly Riesling planted, but it's changing slowly. Um, and unfortunately, there's not much um, Pinot Noir Rosé, the people usually do Blanc de Noir here. Um, I have no idea why. I think it's, it's a trendy thing from the 80s. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a bit, yeah, it's fun. But um, yeah, till 1890, 1900 was super important um, also to have red wines, um, but then, or red priorities to make also Rosé, but then uh, Riesling took over more or less. So your, what made you decide to make rosé? To be very, very honest with you, I wanted to do a nice, easy drinking red wine. Red wine. <laughs> that was Whoa. actually my goal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But now the, the, the best decision is that I did a rosé out of it because I work with nature and I don't like, this is, um, I, I'm working for a winery called Staffel der Hof, um, very famous. It's the oldest winery in Germany, seven oldest in the world. And... Um, I really like the red wine, so, but I'm not living like, I can do what actually I want with my wines and my projects. So it wasn't actually very possible to do a red wine like I wanted to do it. So I changed it to, okay, let's make a rosé and it was the best decision in my life. Um, this rosé represents everything I like to have. It's nice, it's easy drinking, it's natural, it's clean, it's super fun. 
uh, and I did also a part uh, like a pet nut and um, like I did actually two wines which were way better for me and uh, for my customers and friends and that was a really good decision to make a to make a rosé actually and I'm looking already forward to do rosé this year again. <laughs> And so just one more question then, do you find, so we've had Jorge talking about the altitude and the cool climate and the limestone giving freshness. Do you find where you are in Germany, the freshness that you have with your climate and your terroir is helping create a good rosé? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, depends what you'd like to have in your rosé. I mean, there are so many different types of palettes in the world, but I rather focus on like, a nice easy drinking low alcohol palette with the freshness like you actually want to like after one sip you like to have another one um and make it easy going but it's always a decision from the winemaker and what's possible um uh, i could also do like more um, maturation time i could do this this year to give more complex speed to this um but it's a decision what you like to have and probably how to like to represent your personality in the wine but right. freshness is uh, very important and the cool climate here is definitely um, um, important to do this type of easy going um, low alcohol wines. Okay, so that, that leads us uh, on to my next question. You mentioned maceration and we have uh, Johannes, who I think is probably the most extreme maceration um, winemaker for Rosé. Um, if we can ask you a bit about how you arrived at your color for your rosé and for those who have not yet seen it this is your one of johannes's rosés this is newman um this is revolution <laughs> i've got newman you've got revolution so johannes makes three rosés all a beautiful dark color so johannes can you talk a bit about your skin contact and how you arrived at this color yeah, so um, as we talked before, there's no real tradition in my area in producing rosé and therefore it was not uh, really hard for me to um, to do something different. So uh, I have a wide range of, uh, of white wines where I do also some skin macerations. But uh, the thing is, so for the Newman rosé, um, I have an old vineyard of uh, 110 years old uh, St. Laurent. And uh, the idea was what should I do with this vineyard? Should I do a classic, ordinary uh, red wine or uh, something different? And uh, I think if you do a red wine, yeah, you have the tannins, uh, you have maybe a bit fatness in the St. Laurent, but it's not what I really love or what I really like. And therefore the idea was to do a rosé, but in a very special way. And therefore uh, we do here the fermentation in, uh, in Amphora, so we, uh, it's a semi carbonic uh, fermentation of uh, whole clusters. Mm -hmm. So we made a cluster selection in the vineyard, uh, put the whole clusters in the amphora. Then we add um, um, carbonic from, uh, from, from the other fermentation. Mm -hmm. And then we seal the amphora. And after seven or eight months, we open the, the amphora, uh, put out the whole fermented grapes and press it uh, gently by hand. Then we do a sedimentation for two or three months in uh, 500 liter oak barrels and then we bottle it. So it's in the end a very uncomplicated way to make a rosé. Very but a, dif a, but a different way. So just for those of you who don't know how the majority, you know, over 50% of the world's rosé is made. Um, early harvest put into a gentle press under with a cold temperature, two to three hours press and then fermented in a stainless steel tank at a cool temperature with the right fruity yeast to get the right fruit character. So that is what over 50% of Wells Rosé is. So then you can see the extreme of these different methods that are going on. And what about your others? You've got Solera as well. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, yeah, so this was, so as the, in the end I have three Rosés, uh, an entry level, what is, um, with a short skin contact uh, from uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. And then I have the Solera. It comes a bit later because I also have uh, Soleras from a red and from a white. And for me, it was the missing link in the whole assortment was also to do a, a bit aged uh, rosé. And this one uh, is also from three varieties. It's the 
again, a St. Laurent. So for St. Laurent, you use uh, three vintages in the Sorero system. Then I have um, three vintages of uh, Syrah, what is also in the Sorero system. And 50% of the whole blend is uh, out of a Rösler. Mm -hmm. So Rösler is a PV grape, but brings a lot of fruit, uh, a lot of freshness, a lot of acidity. And this is, I think, uh, in the end, for me, the perfect blend. Uh, what gives freshness, what gives minerality, saltiness, but shows also a ripe character. This is what I like. Somebody's asked, uh, what percentage is carbonic in your fermentation of the Newman? Newman, 100%. 100% carbonic, okay. Yeah. Um, now, uh, uh, for the Newman, uh, St. Laurent, 100%. Okay. And 100% uh, carbonic fermented. Okay. There you go. Um, I can just say that it is incredibly luscious and fruity and um, uh, when you people say when they see this colour, is it going to be tannic or is it going to be sweet? And it is neither. It is just lots and lots of fruit and very, very silky texture. Um, and yes, you would say it's a rosé because it has none of the tannic structure that you would have expected from a, a wine that colour. So this is what, one of the reasons I really was quite excited by this wine is this challenging of uh, linking with colour and style. Um, I don't um, get how after so much time it's not red. So we have a, a question from Philip. How come you get this colour with the amount of time on the skins? But it is, it's been fermented whole grapes. So no, right, carry it's, on. It's it's if you if you ferment the whole clusters and the skin is not destroyed, uh, you don't extract that much color. So it's fermented fruit meat, it's fermented juice, but it's not it's not really a skin fermentation in the end, and therefore it's not so tannic. Yeah, for sure you have structure, you have texture, you have a bit of tannins, but never the same like you do the same fermentation with broken skins uh, where you push down and so on. And mm. yeah, okay. In fact, there is an old-fashioned, uh, in northern Spain, there's a, um, a rosé where they also use carbonic fermentation in the same way, which is quite interesting. Okay, so I'm now going on to um, looking at the next dark rosé, which is called Rose and the Vampire. Right, uh, Johan, can you show the mountains behind you? Yep. Uh. <laughs> I've got to get up. <laughs> Somewhere. Okay, it's over there. Over okay. there. So, Johan is in Austria, and the mountains behind him are the small Carpathians. And we're now going to fly over the small Carpathians into Slovakia. The, uh, Directly yes. onto the other side. Misho, Misho is, uh, yes, is named Kessa on your screen, guys. All right, Misho? Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, Misho Kuropka, and I think uh, Agnes left you alone but uh, she was there before oh, she I, <laughs> oh, there she goes just, um, yeah. no i just wanted to because i i mentioned it in my introduction a fascinating story just before we talk uh, wine making and uh, <laughs> vi viticulture but uh, guys this is really a, a very touching uh, story because you have here um, a historic farm belonged to the family uh, for generations and um, after Second World War was taken away, just like that. And it's only until 1989 that uh, the government uh, allowed three years, I believe, to, for people to reclaim land. And uh, the parents, because your family there, there's uh, um, Agnes and Misho are a brother, uh, she's his sister-in-law and uh, the related and um, there's other the partners involved and the kids involved and uh, but they uh, took over this uh, estate again and decided to do what they're doing now which is not just vineyards they grow uh, rapeseed and uh, other crops so that's that's the story i wanted to tell about the history of uh, 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 slobodne which means freedom right yeah well, the Slobodna is adjective. So I like free. Free. Like freedom free. is a verb. So take it from there. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I first met uh, Agnes and Miso ooh, 18 months ago. I think about 18 months ago. Um, 
where we had a, a great tasting. We went through their entire range and we got more and more excited as the range went on. And at that point, you had a rosé called Rubella Rose, Rosa. Do you yeah. still make that? Yes. Um, and then Rose and the Vampire, which is a new rosé. Um, but I just wanted to ask you a bit about, um, which probably nobody else realises, the problems that natural winemaking has in Slovakia concerning filtration. Which I know is not directly related to rosé, but um, might be of quite a lot of interest to people. It's a general uh, problem. And the problem is that uh, Slovak, Slovakia is a very old land but very young country or nation and our administration is very formalistic so uh, they need to go <coughs> by the book and uh, 99 percent of the market is industrialized so using the industrial modern reductive standard on making wines so basically and they in position that they cannot define what is like what we are doing here because the taste and uh, color and uh, look is very different so basically yeah but it's uh, not just about the filtration it's also about the color so for example they oh. say that uh, slovak leg legislation doesn't recognize for example the orange colors because we know only white rosa and red so there is a bunch of bunch of problems in it and what so, about this color rosé is this color rosé acceptable yeah yeah that's fine until it's, it is not cloudy or until it is not really oxidative but this is fine so yeah. can you tell us a bit about how you made um rose and the vampire mm. actually when speaking about the rosé mm -hmm. formally for, for me a rosé can be defined by the color so if the color is rosé it's rosé in a substance uh, for me, rosé is a uh, white wine out of uh, red grapes. As uh, orange is a uh, red wine out of uh, white grapes. Okay. With many exemptions. <laughs> uh, but uh, we've been experimenting a lot with many different vessels. And we have uh, 12... Uh, Tinajas from Spain, mm -hmm. Pad Padilla, the terracotta vessels, uh, mm -hmm. which was uh, like good experiment, and uh, we want to use uh, amphoras for elevating the reds. But we tried to ferment the rosé. Tinajas. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, Tinajas. Yes. Uh, so, before... Uh, so, we use uh, Tinajas only for fermentation of rosé and elevage of red. So, we don't use skins in uh, Tinajas. Okay. Because uh, we went from very long skin contact to slighter lower and uh, i think uh, the tinajas provide uh, for uh, oxidative environment and uh, 400 liter volume is very good for fermentation and uh, it's relatively uh, cool and uh, slow fermentation and uh, the difference between uh, Rebella Rosa and uh, La Rosa La Vampire is that uh, Rebella is uh, the wine that we want people to drink as they would 
as being in our cellar, so without any manipulation. Uh, without adding sulfites, uh, so the wine uh, ferments one uh, month in uh, amphora without skin contact. So it's direct press with the stem, we directly press uh, the, the wine without any sulfur stays overnight to sediment um, the dirt mm -hmm. and then uh, goes to amphora for one month and uh, in 2018 some amphoras were more darker than we would normally expect so we selected those and uh, elevated them for more time in uh, ovoid, which is synthetic egg. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rebella Rosa is just wrecked once and then directly battled. And uh, yes, yes. La Rose et la Vampire, yeah. and La Rose et la Vampire is uh, wrecked. 30 milligrams uh, of uh, Sulfur added before button and button, but uh, in the end, uh, 26 milligrams of total sulfur. So, um, and uh, what grape varieties? It's over um, refined rose. It is. I mean, again, very silky. It's Cabernet and Blau Frankish, Francovka yeah, Modra, yeah. no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so for those Blau Frankish, Frankovka Modra, Cake Frankosh, we'll go on to donkeys later. Um, but this is a very, very classic variety, I think, a very good variety for rosé in Central Europe, um, which I think is good. Um, maybe we can... But go, really, yeah? But really also, <laughs> uh, I think uh, the Cabernet uh, Savignon, mm -hmm. uh, is the second most planted um, red variety in Slovakia as a result of uh, post uh, communism boom or fashion of planting. But uh, Cabernet Sauvignon makes beautiful rose in Slovakia. But Although it makes a very the, different style, no? It's make, usually Slovakian rosé is a bit more residual sugar. Yeah, 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 um, exactly. But the aromatic profile of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, a lot of cassis, a lot of uh, mint, mm -hmm. uh, plus beautiful acidity, and residual sugar makes very approachable, easy drinking wine. So this is quite a quite a dramatically different style of rosé in Slovakia then yeah um do you think how do people react to it in Slovakia do they regard it as very different wine culture in Slovakia is not that developed okay so, all right mm -hmm. I think I think they they consider the the whole winery as a, as a, as a bit different than the rest <laughs> And uh, so, so it's not uh, it's it's not about the particular wine. It's more about the uh, the whole the whole winery. And it's not only us. It's uh, all the natural winemakers in Slovakia, I, I would say. And uh, need to be said that the the majority of the natural wine from Slovakia are are export are, are exported actually. So okay. there is not such a developed uh, local scene. Local scene. Local natural drinkers, I would say. So you sell in the UK. Do you sell in America as well, or where yeah, else? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. In America, okay. in Canada, in Japan, in like many countries. Okay. Um, I think. But uh, can we go on now to um, talking about um, this breaking of tradition? So Johannes you were saying that you could make whatever style you liked because there was no tradition in Austria for making rosé. But your rosé is still very different to other Austrian rosés. Um, how are you regarded by other people in Austria? I think most of them don't know what I'm doing here. Um, so, 
maybe they know the the entry level, but uh, I think most of them don't know. Yeah, for sure, the, the the few natural places in Austria they know what I'm doing here, but most of the people don't know uh, my my other styles of uh, of rosé or uh, of the Soriero or the Newman. They didn't know it. Don't know about it, Lisa. Lisa, I just want to uh, let, let people know. Johannes told me today that uh, uh, out of everything he makes, he keeps only about 12 or 18 bottles uh, because uh, he makes small quantities and they wrestle it out of him. The people in UK and wherever else. He, he said, so it's, it's, I, I, I doubt if people in Austria get to taste his wine. Maybe in furs or uh, trade furs or you tell us, but you said it already. People don't know about you that much. The rosé, at least. Uh, so I don't show it at, at Austrian fairs. So uh, in Austria, I do only the, the via vinum uh, each second time, but I don't do another fair in Austria. And uh, I do all the raw fairs around the world. And uh, sometimes I do the pro wine, but that's it. And uh, also, also pro wine. I don't, yeah, and Miller's in beer. Yeah, at Miller's in beer, I have the, the Newman Rosé with me, but mm. not for everyone. Uh, yeah. It makes no sense to, to show uh, very special styles of wine uh, to people who don't understand it in the end. Yeah, I understand. Um, so uh, just going on to Jan then uh, for Rosé in Germany. I was on a Rosé trip in Germany in February and most people were quite shocked that anyone in Germany would make Rosé when you could be making Riesling everywhere. Um, do you find people respond differently to you making Rosé? Or is not a problem? Depends on the style. If you do natural, it's kind of cool. And there are some spots in Germany where people are drinking truly natural wine, which is fantastic. But uh, in general, it's something, I don't know. Um, usually, like, there's a stereotype, which, like, a lady <laughs> is drinking the rosé. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, still going on here. Um, but depends on the style of your rosé, for sure. Okay, um, so what about um, if you're making uh, your rosé and you're, you said natural is okay, um, do you want to talk a bit about your natural farming techniques? Um, we, we heard yesterday about you teaching your chickens to fly. Yeah, um, yeah probably in the chicken process. Chicken process. So <laughs> can you talk about how natural your rosé is? My natural is... I don't know, probably the supernatural stuff you can get. So my, when people ask me all the time, like, so what did you do with the wine in the cellar? I have really to say nothing, <laughs> really nothing. Um, I, I do spray organic, I um, do biodynamic um, elements. I work together with the um, Demeter farm uh, close by. And for me, it was sure that I have to be in the process of getting uh, animals back into this winery here or the winery where I work with um, and have the system again. So my idea is have a kind of chicken tractor in the in the lines uh, of the vineyard so they can mow the grass and um, do their business there. And on the other hand, I have eggs and also uh, meat at one point. So it's a kind of system and yeah, this is my, my, my future for the, or my goal for the next seven years to implement more. And also my boss, which is also, his name is Jan. Um, he is starting to have a big um, hybrid uh, project of three hectares. And we have also Ousson Sharp um, Sheeps mm -hmm. coming. And also a special guy from uh, South Africa. His name is Cozy. And he's also a biodynamic winemaker. And now he's here. So it's a big, big things going on. So actually we go um, step um, back and see how, how it was back in the days actually and just be more modern and yeah this is what we do. That's interesting so uh, Jorge can we go to you in Spain because you are not the avant-garde avant uh, avant biodynamic natural you are still going along this very traditional style and you were saying how at 900 meters your climate isn't the same for that. Um, the biodynamic is beautiful things. Is the beautiful philosophy. Uh, 
but it's the similar philosophy of my grandfather. But uh, the people of the north of Europe is a lot of culture, mm -hmm. and is the more research of the things uh, more um, more of the books, you know. In mm -hmm. the tradition in this area is um, uh, thank you for for the sky, for the sunny for the altitude is not necessary a lot of the chemic products okay. and the small things uh, with the attention with the for example for the the cooper is mm -hmm. basic things the basic things is uh, the the not uh, work with the rain um, is necessary to the harvest and um be careful with the equinoxio equinoxio with the autumn mm -hmm. and uh, uh, not uh, the work uh, the wines with when the borrasca is this uh, not the days of the winds is the things uh, very basic uh, it's not the biodynamic the but biodynamic it's, uh, it's possible to research the things for more complicated because because in other countries is more complicated make the viticulture in our uh, country and our area is very easy make the viticulture the viticulture normal if uh, when uh, I pa I speak with the uh, ten uh, ten thousand kilos is more complicated make the the good things is possible to resist to the biodynamic, so but I think the biodynamic is uh, ninety percent of the people make biodynamic is only for the marketing, and this is not like this. I like the the people, the natural people, to resist the natural things, mm -hmm. the natural wines. This is the why for me, and the biodynamic. I think is the sensation of the soil, the, to the vineyard, to the star, to the people, is feel the other things. It's not only the philosophy of Rodolf Steiner with uh, traduction of Nicola Jolie, after make the same things in Argelia, in Spain, or in Val de Loire, or Dinamarca. Mm. Uh, the biodynamic, I think oh, when I am very young, is uh, studying the biodynamic. Rudolf Steiner speak uh, the biodynamic is uh, another thing. Is the adaptation of the medium. It's not possible to make the same things in each area. Don't, I, 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 creo. ¿Cómo es creo? Yo creo. I, 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 th I think. I think. I think is the the biodynamic is the the logical things in the head. So your wine is, um, I think, one of the more traditional of your region. Is that because you're having this very small quantity, this very dedicated approach? I mean, your rosés are very complex and layered, um, age beautifully. Is that because you have this the, the Clarete, um, uh, our name is not Whispering Angel, you know? My name is Domino Laguila. Is the in a small cellar, and uh, my our vineyard is small, and the cellar is small, and uh, we make the small quantity. But uh, in ten years, uh, my sons uh, won't make more quantity is possible. What not? The quantity is not problem. I think. Uh, the thing is make the wine with the the hearth with the oh, this this you know yeah, but uh, <laughs> the quantity i think is not a problem because um, the now in the wine is a lot of things not good a lot of snob things are not uh, snob uh, the the people understand uh, zero 
No, the, the wine is easy thing. It's an easy thing. It's the the drink uh, for 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 um, alimento. ¿Cómo se dice alimento? For and, and, oh. se nourri d'abord. Le vin, oh. c'est quelque chose que ça te nourri. Uh, after, it's happy thing. Is is you, you dar? ¿Cómo es dar? Dar. You give give mm -hmm. uh, give uh, the things beautiful and um, I don't know but uh, the other people speak uh, you know <laughs> my wife is it's possible make a lot of the good wine I, but uh, for me it's not possible make a lot of clarete a lot of white a lot of peña saladas a lot of cantara perdiz it's not possible um, uh, I am wine life uh, so can we go on? Yesterday you mentioned the the impact of uh, pink champagne and Provence rosé helping the sales of rosé. Yes, yes. It's not possible to sell the the rosé more twenty euros if, um, before the Provence rosé wines. It's not possible. Mm. The people with a lot of money. Uh, paying the good uh, price for the rosé wines mm -hmm. or grass of the Provence wine and the rosé rosé champagne. Okay. Rosé champagne is in uh, the, the the beautiful beautiful wines, beautiful wines. And, and this is the for the question before the the men the the. Um, more beauty rosé wines of limestone in, I'm tasting okay. is champagne. Lim, yeah. Limestone is champagne. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go on to Jan for that. Um, so you mentioned you make a pet gnat. I don't know if anyone has seen the news today that Prosecco have now given the go-ahead for pink Prosecco. Um, so pink sparkling, pink champagne is very fashionable. And you do a pink pet gnat. So, can you tell us about the market for pink pet gnat? Muting. Got one mute him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, my, my pink pet gnat. Um, I never had a. I never sold so much wine in, in this short period. <laughs> um, it was uh, crazy, actually. Like people was like, "You have more pet nut? I want to have more pet nut." And even I have a very lovely um, importer in in, uh, in Glasgow. Um, and I have to say, I'm I'm so sorry because I had a friend and he's going to marry and he won't have my pet nut on his wedding. So <laughs> it went so, uh, away so fast. It's uh, it's super fun. Um, Thankfully, it's a super clean, nice pet nut, um, easy drinking as well. Um, and yeah, I have, I have a nice fancy label, uh, which is, I'm not really focused on. It was an artist and it's called Cosmo Nut. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> word. Name, and yeah, it was that, I only did 450 bottles of, um, of my, my little one, uh, of my Cosmo Nut. But um, yeah, next year, I'm going to extend that a little bit. Still a small quantity, but a little bit more would be nice. So I have also something to put my side. <laughs> the pink bubbles. Does anybody else make pink bubbles? Compl Do you, Slobodny? Slobodny, you make pink bubbles? Sparkling pink wine? Hold on, hold on. It'll, it'll t wait a second because I'm. Yeah, go on. Yep. <laughs> mm, Rebella Rosa. Is sparklish. Sparklish. So, um, sparklish. Uh, <laughs> and that's maybe one of the reasons why not to use um, sulfur in uh, rose or even a white. That. Uh, you may expect that uh, when you bottle it like early spring, there's mm -hmm. still some residual sugar left in the wine. So when you bottle it, after bottling the wine moves. So creates 
bubbles. Not really something that you would consider be a uh, frizzante even. Like, it's like uh, you burn one uh, gram of uh, residual sugar in a bottle, even less. Still, there's this spark in wine. Makes it more mm, uh, refreshing. Comparing to comparing to vampire, um, for example, uh, which, which has some amount of sulfur. Strictly still, and uh, yeah, <laughs> we have some uh, undisclosed uh, projects that we are um, <laughs> waiting for, <laughs> but. Uh, we haven't released anything in the... Uh... Ah, so next vintage we'll see some different wines, maybe. Well, Misha is talking about the rosé that uh, was re-fermented in, in a bottle. bottle. So... Ooh, okay. So, so this is a big market. Maybe, but um, it's complicated. And it's... Uh, for us, it's a logistic challenge to make a base wine for sparkling rosé with our 17 hectares it's very hard to manage uh, because there are different varieties that are ripening and we have to harvest complicated so i really understand uh, i don't see much difference between uh, making uh, good uh, sparkling pet nut from uh, Pinot Gris compared to Blau Frankish, basically. Okay. But um, I understand the point. It, it really, it's very individual and it uh, depends on uh, each winery. Like uh, you can do a perfect uh, Rosé Petronat if the majority of your vineyard is red. Okay. Um, and if, yeah, if you have plenty of grapes to play with. If you have just a small quantity of red, then it's more complicated because added value is more in red than rosé. So do or... you plant more red varieties for this? We don't want to plant anything. We have planted okay. <laughs> too much. <laughs> um, can I throw a question open to everyone? Um, maybe someone else has a, an answer to this. So, um, as I say, it's 50% and growing of Provence style rosé, of this, this pale pink dry rosé. And a lot of producers who make, um, I spoke to a lot of producers in Ribera del Duero who said they no longer make traditional rosé, they're now making pale pink because they cannot sell darker rosés with individual character. Um, they cannot make natural rosé because it has to be on the market by January. How do you all feel making this uh, more traditional or more alternative rosé? Are there problems on the market? Johannes, do you want to answer? Yeah, so uh, for me, uh, it's the same thing with the white wine. So I'm not the first one who bottling the white wine. So uh, it's for me also not a problem to bring uh, a natural rosé, uh, maybe uh, beginning of next harvest or bringing uh, the Soreras uh, sometimes uh, one year later or bringing my entry level of rosé a bit later. Why should everything uh, should be so fast? makes no sense in the end. <laughs> I totally agree, Johannes. I totally agree. You just have to start it with it. Like if you're in this machinery of uh, you want to deliver in January or something, it's just stupid. Why needs time? It was always like this. If you think, if you're looking back to Mosul, you want to have a dry stair it took two years. So we said there's one harvest in the vineyard, one harvest in the cellar, and one harvest in the sale. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but definitely time is so important. But depends on your own needs and how you are, how your system works for you. If you want to make money with wine and you're in the supermarket, whatever, it's uh, well, you know, 
Agnes? And, uh, and plus, I think that the, the expectation of wine releasing is uh, more significant for the conventional wine world. I think it's, it's not that uh, important in the natural wine world, or at least it's our yeah. uh, experience that the people are not like asking us in, in January for the rosé because it's like, uh, well, we are not releasing the wine according to, 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 the market. to, to this kind of expectation. So, yeah. and people are, our our customers, I I don't see a pro I don't see they have a problem with it. So, I think it's more like it's more for other style of wines. Okay. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, I, I, I would just add that um, it took us quite a long time to show our customers that we are releasing wine when they are ready. So we release uh, wines in given year through several vintages. And we release uh, rosé when it's ready. Basically, maybe it's a, they don't really care. We, don't, uh, we only have two rosé wines um, and uh, the quality of rosé that we sell can keep the quality regardless whether it's current vintage or vintage after and that's i think uh, it's very relevant uh, argument for making rosé if you make low intervention rosé that it's based purely on the fruit you don't need to be worried about uh, selling it fast because uh, it retains the qualities. Oh, no, it improves in a battle. Okay. Compared to conventional industrial stuff that it needs to sell um, in a current vintage because uh, the next uh, vintage is coming and uh, when the next vintage comes, the old vintage uh, automatically is less attractive or even not sellable. Exactly, and uh, and, and uh, what I see in the natural wine world or within the natural winemakers, I, I see that the slight move, according to Rosé, to the wines that are that are more. Uh, that has more structure or more soulful rosé, I, I would say, because it's a it's a term I I I, I uh, hear more and more often uh, that they that the winemakers try to make rosé not just as a funny wine or just the summer wine, but but as a wine from red grapes that 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 has some structure and, and that that can age also. That leads us. That leads us perfectly to the to the age ageability, please. I think because it's definitely on our uh, topics to 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 talk about. Uh, so, uh, age worthy rosés and uh, substance in rosé, and take it from there. Whoever has the mic microphone well, you're, open. You're gay. We when I visited his cellar. We did a vertical tasting, I think, six vintages in your cellar of your rosé, um, which was fascinating because we saw all the vintage variation. Your rosés definitely age very, very well. The first vintage tasting, I think, is 2011. Yeah. Just uh, 2018 or 19, I don't know, when you... when. 2018, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, definitely uh, the clarete aging very good because uh, why not? The white uh, wine aging very well, mm -hmm. and uh, in Spain, for example, the the best um, the wines aging better is the white wine, is the Jerez. For example, is the Muscat, mm -hmm. is a um, white nut. In Burgundy, for example, is the star of the world, the white wine. 
is doing very well. And uh, in Spain, for example, and a good example is uh, Viña Tondonia, for example. Yes. You tasting the wines with 50 years, beautiful, the white you wines. Think rosé should be able to age as well? I think, uh, yes, very well, but I don't know because the more, uh, more old wine I taste in, Clarete, is the when my sister Estela is born in 75 and is is very well because is the fresher is very good but is the the, the very rustic wines okay. i don't know now what is the future i don't know it's very young appellation and before you speak why do you make the rosé or clarete or we make uh, clarete because in my family drink clarete. It's not possible oh make not clarete. It's all wine each, the, each uh, days. When um, the aging, for the moment, the, the, the 2011, 2010, it's beautiful. Beautiful. And uh, before, uh, I don't know, but because uh, the the winemaker love a lot of uh, shimmy, mm -hmm. a lot of yeast, a lot of enzyme, a lot of things. So uh, in Rival Duero, not history, the last uh, 20, 50 years ago, the true clarete. Don't, so it's impossible I see is the good aging. But I think, why, why not? Good peas, good grapes, good uh, soil. Why not? Why not? Okay, sounds yeah. good. Yesterday, Jorge, yesterday you were telling us about the ability of your clarete to encapsulate the the year, the vintage, yes. and to really give a very good more than you say more than the red and the white, give a very good uh, transmission of the vintage. Yes, because the white variety is the sulfite, is the, the more contact with the skin, with the barrel, with the yeast. It's more sensible. But uh, the clarete is uh, the, the press, is more or less uh, very quickly, and uh, is the photo of the vintage. It's true, it's the a slow fermentation, but uh, when you you make the, the the vertical. You remember Elizabeth? Yes, it's I do. The for example the sunny vintage. In a, completely different. Sunny vintage. I don't know 2011, 15, and uh, I don't know. Um, but after you in the in the mood it is. Uh, it's possible 2011, it's possible 2015, but it's very clearly, it's very, very clearly. The Clarete, um, for me, the, the, the old vineyard and the, in, the, in the limestone is a lot of uh, powerful, a lot of power. Mm. And uh, uh, in this country, a lot of sunny in the September is uh, fire. It's fire in the skin. Don't, the alcohol is more high. The sensation is more alcoholic. Don't, is, uh, but for example, 2013 is very fresh, 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 fresh. It's more difficult uh, in the, when the wine is very young, but now it's incredible. But now it's very good. And I think I was very surprised at the vintage variation. It was very very dramatic on the different styles um what about uh johannes do you do your roses age i think so yeah uh, the other question is does also white wine age because also in white wine you don't have a lot of tannins or structure why also could not the rosé age well, sure, rosé can, can, can age uh depends <laughs> what do you expect from an aged rosé if you have a rosé with, with, uh, with acidity, so same like most of the white wines have, for sure it can mature and it can ripe. So let me just say, um, when I was um, researching for my book and discovered that 
if I showed somebody an aged rosé, they would say, but it doesn't taste like a young rosé. And I'd go, well, no, because it has aged. We're no longer going to have primary fruit like a white wine or a red wine at ages. It will change character. And what I realized is that we don't really have a very good vocabulary to describe a rosé that ages. We, all our concentration on rosé is to describe it as being fresh, fruity, yeah. strawberries, whatever. And we don't understand how to say, but yes, maybe it's got a little bit more dried fruit character or, or <clears throat> dried flowers. And so we are very often, it's our fault that we don't describe it well. But I think also comparing with maybe more commercial rosé where they make it with a yeast designed to age quite quickly to be drunk within the summer. I'm presuming you all use spontaneous fermentation. You don't, do you all buy, any of you buy yeast or it's all your own yeast? So we make only from the natural fermentation. So we do uh, with spontaneous fermentation, so we don't buy anything. It's not allowed by Demeter Austria. Okay. And everyone else as well? It's natural. Natural yeast. Um, for me, that makes a big not, difference. Not another person question for the malolactic. Yeah. Or why not malolactic? No it's malolactic. I don't love in the meridional wines the malolactic uh, in the wines. Okay. Uh, for Misha wanted to say something about the yeast, I think. Um, uh, some comments. Um, we don't use, um, we ferment spontaneously, but also spontaneously in a sense that uh, each tank is fermented spontaneously. So we don't uh, grow our uh, mother. Some, some people do. It's more safer. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got, uh, I've got a, photo, a photo of the bloom on your grapes. <laughs> That's Blau Frankish. <laughs> um, but um, Mosquito. I think um, ageability of uh, rosé starts in the winemaker's uh, head. So you can make rosé to age. If you can be the agagia, eat it eh? as a <laughs> wine to eat. Um, like, but there is difference in aging white compared to rosé. Like a practical example. Uh, Riesling, this uh, noble uh, white variety transforms in a battle relatively significantly like the battle aging provides uh, different changes in taste structure in uh, rosé i find that uh, it's not that significant but uh, so the taste profile is not changing that significantly but it retains its freshness for a long period of time so if you taste five years old rosé you drink it and you say oh what a fresh wine and you look on the label and 2013 and you say wow that's uh, seven years old rosé but uh, that's uh, only Slobodna experience. Uh, it can be very different in, it really depends on each particular wine. Hmm. Interesting. Moshe, your final question? Ah, oh, it's good to know natural wine is known to it. Yes, so this is an interesting thing and these wines having more character matching better with food than just neutral rosés. I think that's something which can really be sold. I think they have a good market with the sommelier. When we have restaurants again, 
um, to sell with natural rosé or more rosés with more tradition? Yes, I, I wanted to suggest that it's a, a the tradition or color or I don't know what to link it in uh, substance, but uh, we touched on all these uh, subjects now, but uh, I think um, Liz, is the, the question to you is, uh, um, I think you said that just over 50% of the world rosés, the pale, you call it sometimes swimming pool rosé. Mm. Um, and is it not a good time now, especially with so many natural producers that make very interesting food demanding i mean the, the the wine i'm drinking here is uh, is definitely crying out for food it can be um it's it, and i know that we sometimes overlap into the uh, realm of maybe what people would call red so these these wines have maybe to carve a category for themselves it's a bit of a problem i mean we we were talking with uh, simon wolf uh who did the book amber wine um, earlier on this week. And what's curious is if I said the wine was orange or amber or skin contact, the market thinks of it as being fashionable and trendy. As soon as you mention the word rosé, a totally different mindset appears. And I, I ask around and I say to professionals, which rosé do you like better? And that people, professionals would like all of these rosés but then they say we can't sell them it's a hand sell um the market wants pale pink the market wants whispering angel and it really if you can show people these wines then they like them but it is it's it's incredibly difficult to to get people to try these wines uh, well, I think I think uh, uh, Jorge is maybe is on to something here because um, he's um, well, it's not his own branding, but the reviving the clarete might be a, a way forward for that uh, that genre, that uh, that uh, substance rosé wine, and uh, because I think shading under the umbrella of rosé sometimes can be comfortable, but it's a double-edged sword. So, um, uh, because the, the, um, the thing is that we make the, the wines in the country, uh, we are the lucky people because in the Shin people, for example, like this style. Not a lot of alcohol with acidity, with the very good with uh, a lot of things for the food. And for example, like uh, the other big market for us is New York, because uh, he's a lot of uh, different food in the world, is the mixed, and uh, we are the lucky, the lucky people. Is uh, in the in Spain, for example, uh, the the more big um, um, clients mm -hmm. is the the three star restaurant Michelin is that we are the lucky people because our wines uh, is now is the traditional wine but with the globalization food and this thing is beautiful thing for the clarete wine because it's uh, fresh is um, I respond you or not <laughs> Are you understand or not? <laughs> yes. it, uh, this is um, this is an interesting thing on on markets, isn't it? You know, I was, um, you've all mentioned uh, America for sales, or the Far East, or Japan. Um, in um, in the in United States, is incredible for the rosé, for the clarete. For example, Tempié in very famous in the Bandol, Bandol. the Rosé is, is incredible in New York too. But the new, but not the new Tempié, with uh, three years, four years, five, five years. Yeah. Tondonia is an iconic wine now. 
was 2009 is the current vintage so yes but, uh, but uh, Dondonia not make a rosé, I think, uh, yeah. in uh, five years because it's not uh, sell the wine. But it's beautiful, know. beautiful wine. I yes. think um, the problem with somewhere like Tompier is people are now tasting 2019 and it takes three or four years to be good. It's They're drinking it too young, which is a big problem. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, I think uh, it's a uh, list, unless we have uh, something any else. Questions? Or, any questions for anybody or the winemakers want to mention things amongst themselves? I think Jan wants to say something. Yes, just a, just a thing about um, what Liz just said about um, that a rosé, and everyone's like, oh no, I don't want to have a rosé. And I think we winemakers are sometimes our own like we are stuck in this label, it's rosé, so I have to write rosé on the label. But as I do, like I have a brand, you know, it called like, it's called Fosses Conaut. So it's an astronaut on it. And I don't call it anywhere on the label that it's a rosé. It's a Pinot Noir natural wine. And this is what my um, thing is about. And why don't you call it rosé? Like it's not a rosé, it's whatever it is. It's natural wine for me. And um, people have to get rid of these borders. Um, and okay. the sommelier or the... the or my my uh, my um, yeah, the sommeliers or the people who import the wine, they have to to sell it and they have to make sure that people understand that this is not rosé in the classic style. Classic style, style, style. Type of thinking. I mean, everyone is probably I mean, doing everyone this. is probably doing this. One thing, if for us, for example, in the tasting, the people when you make. Uh, do you want testing clarete? No, no, clarete is the second wine. No, not, but, uh, <laughs> not clarete, not red. Not clarete, not white wine. <laughs> if you don't taste my clarete, you can't I taste remember, my red. I remember, I um, remember in, uh, in men uh, with a lot of money, the Russian people, yeah. uh, because I, I come in always with the clarete for the fresh chin, where the, uh, and uh, the, the the men, rosé not is the the woman is the the rosé pistine not for me no, I don't know. You taste in the rosé or you go out? Uh, it's the life. <laughs> and go out, go out. The Russian men and the the different go out because this no rosé. I don't taste in anything. My, for me, the the clarete is my wine. It's not possible not tasting. And always in the tasting, I want tasting before clarete because it's the life. I, I make a small quantity of the wine and it's my, it's my life. Well, it's a small thing. I, I obligation for tasting. <laughs> 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 good, good job you agree to that vertical, uh, Liz. Uh, I know. Well, I went there to taste the clarity, so I was okay. Yeah, I I agree with Diane that it's uh, much more about the approach of the winemaker. So uh, I think our approach is it's, um, not really the uh, the the fulfilling the expectation of how the for example, the rosé should be, or, or what are the people expecting? It's more about where we are playing with the grapes. We are trying the best we can do. And then uh, we just try to find our people who will understand the wine as we do. So it's, uh, I, I don't want to pinpoint the, the, the classical wine world and the natural wine world uh, too much because it doesn't, do good to us uh, or to the relationships with, within the winemakers and all the relationships. But I think that there, there, is, a, there is a significant difference uh, in, the, in, in this approach. So what, what we are trying to achieve is to make the best wine in the vintage from, 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 from our grapes. And uh, then basically try to explain to people what we did and what we tried to achieve, and uh, then, then, then we see and we somehow uh, find those people. So maybe that's why, uh, for example, 
that's why the majority of our wines are exported because uh, sometimes it's hard to find those people around here who are who who have all these expectation but uh, uh, but we try hard also within our region but uh, I think it's it's more about this approach so and and uh, the rose is a very good example because the rose is generally uh, defined and uh, for example I don't like the definition of rose because it's just the it's just the wine basically you have well you have white grapes and red grapes then you have skin fermented wines and non skin fermented wines so so the rose is uh, the logically one quarter of four types you can you can have from this combination so it's it's yeah. just the it's just the it's not well the 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 common definition of rose uh, uh, is associated with some some i don't know uh, just the summer funny wines uh, and uh, there is not not reason for 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 this for this definition there is not in nature there is not logical reason for this definition so i think uh, that's what what we try to do just play with the grapes and do and and what Jan says i co i totally agree we there is not written that it's a rosé wine it's just the wine from blue grapes red grapes uh fermented without skins that's it fantastic i agree excellent <clears throat> I agree with the comment. George's clarettes are unique. They stand out when you do a, a tasting there. Definitely. And and the, the from uh, the outside, it appears that the uh, natural uh, wine movement is uh, driven from inside. Like winemakers decide to do some things differently, but uh, I think uh, it's uh, sommelier and chef driven, and uh, it is because uh, those who are so much involved with the taste, so many complex tastes there are. Uh, those are the chefs and sommeliers. Mm -hmm. We are just very restricted, uh, living in a own bubble style. So those chefs and sommeliers realize that uh, this is the genuine uh, taste, like cannot food without the sugar in it. Mm -hmm which is completely different to manipulated taste uh, when you can taste all the manipulation that went into it. Because basically, if you're really into wine, in five years, you can read within any wine what happened to it, technologically. You can read uh, from the taste or appearance or the smell, what was done in that wine. Mm. It's relatively simple. And uh, people who are, who are really in a taste, those are the chefs. And they want to have the authentic taste. They don't want to have manipulated product. And yeah. so we need to uh, in the last decade, we're going to see what's going to happen next. Okay. In a fine dine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on that note, uh, we'll wrap it up. Liz, you okay with that? Yes, I'm fine. I, it's been fascinating hearing everyone's comments on their rosé. Um, it's a shame we don't have a virtual tasting at the same time, but next time we can taste everyone's wines together. Be good. Uh, Yes, I uh, just want to uh, thank everybody for joining. I want to thank Liz for uh, helping me with the ways uh, I'm trying to, she's too modest to, to do that. So I'll do that, promote her book. <laughs> so this is the, her book, 
Rosé, understanding the pink wine revolution, uh, and it's available in everywhere. And uh, I recommend it. It uh, uh, touches on all aspects of uh, rosé, including your guys, your rosés. And um, I, um, I I found it fascinating. Uh, well, because it's two things here. We had the natural wine, which we could have a, a discussion of probably three hours a symposium on natural wines and what led you and what inspired you and etc. But uh, to, to narrow it down to the rosé, there you go. Jorge is in the vineyard with the book. Fine <laughs> for me. <laughs> extra point. He's, hold on, hold on, hold on, Jorge. We'll get you. We'll get you. <laughs> He's, I don't speak English, but I am preparing men. You know? <laughs> there you go. So it's it's oh, and then Vivian is with the book. Anybody else want to show the book? Uh. <laughs> so uh, fantastic. I um, I want to let you all know that uh, next uh, Thursday uh, I'll be um, joined by uh, Kathy Van Zale, uh, Master of Wine. She's somewhere there. If you can see her in the dark, somewhere in South Africa, uh, isolated completely. Please join us because South Africa needs your help right now. They are completely insane in how, I don't want to start a discussion, I'm tempted, but I won't, about how they uh, uh, close the country to all alcohol sale. So next Thursday, uh, I'll be joined by Kathy uh, talking to Ken Forrester and uh, Andrea Molyneux about the fascinating story of uh, Chenin Blanc in this country. And we'll take it from there because uh, we have a plan for the following week to, uh, to, to do something else with the uh, South African um, wines. Thank you again, everybody. It's been fascinating. This, uh, uh, if you missed it or if you want to share it, it's recorded and it will be available on my podcast as well as YouTube probably sometime tomorrow. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. And, uh, Oh, thanks everyone for joining in. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.